Oh, 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 oh. Um, we're down on the banks of Cougar Creek again uh, this morning, uh, and Steve and his wife are part of um, Rosalie North Land Care Group. And we've got running water. It's um, probably one of the first spots that we've come across actual running water in Cougar Creek. Uh, and I believe you've done some work on restoring the creek. Yeah, over the years, the, the group's had projects for um, fencing of creek banks for not so much stock exclusion, but for stock, like your control, your grazing of your creek. Yep. It's land care in general yep. for preserving and, and improving your, what you've got. We do control graze our creeks uh, a lot. Um, so that we're not doing damage to the creek bank, which has allowed the, the vegetation to come back. The grass regenerating in the creeks is also like is a great stabiliser for the creek and a, and a holder for the soil. Yep. So you don't get so much damage when you do get these big flood events. Grazing land management uh, really puts a lot of emphasis on stocking rates, pasture availabilities, pasture qualities, uh, and doing forage budgeting. And you'd run that pasture, using that pasture budget, it'd be a rotational management of that pasture? in terms yeah. of paddock to paddock to paddock and, and allow each one to recover? Yeah, we do do rotational grazing. Yes. Uh, we, we need more paddocks to do that more successfully. The creek does make it a little bit more difficult to manage that because summertime we try and keep most of our animals on the home side of the creek because yes. you get rainfall after rainfall, you can't cross the creek. You can't get to the animals, you can't get them home. So we basically, that side of the creek, the other side of the creek, is our winter paddocks. As we were saying before, you know, you have running water here, um, which is, like I said, the, the first we've sort of seen in this in this upper uh, upper catchment area. What's contributed to that? Over the last couple of weeks, we have had a bit of rain, which has helped, but our water holes where we are here, generally, the creek does stop running, but they, the water holes generally stay with water in them. It was uh, Boyne Creek, which is a few k's back up the road towards Kuya, is spring fed from the Palms National Park. Yep. And that water runs down through that, the Boyne Creek into Kuya Creek, a few kilometres above us. And that gives the water holes and the creek just a constant flow uh, all year round, hopefully. Um, the dry years, it does, the creek does stop. But if you get a, a what's classed as sort of a half normal season, the creek will run like this all summer. Then you end up with, with severe weather events like 2011, 2013 with the big floods, and they do a lot of damage, which takes a long time to repair. Well, standing where we are here now, we would have been, I'd say, 10 metres underwater. Wow. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of water came down this creek in 11 and 13. It took a lot of fences. Um, and did a lot of erosion in, in the certain points in the creek where it has changed significantly since those floods. But that's nature doing its thing, I suppose, too. It's... Before you were mentioning that you've got platypus in here, um, and what, what other sort of wildlife have you got around here? We've also recently discovered we've got a native water rat. And other than that, the creek's fish, just native fish with also some introduced species. We're on the top end of the uh, the weir which is in the property next door and years ago that was stocked by the fishing club with yellow belly and bass yes over the years they've i suppose during flood events they've migrated up the creek and they they are populating some of our water holes not to a great extent there's not a lot of them here but uh we've also got the catfish um they're abundant red or blue claw gabby haven't haven't but Potentially. Potentially, haven't had a trap out? No, haven't had a trap out. We had, did have some of them in our dams. And then obviously with the, the abundance of fauna around here, you'd have some good bird life. We've got some great bird life. And we also, when it comes to tree clearing it, there's a balance, again, between what's sustainable and what's unsustainable. <coughs> and a lot of the old timers, oh, you've got to get rid of all your trees they're in that mindset that you've got to, have to get grass, you've got to get rid of all your trees. Well, that's a fallacy. Um, we've proven it, that you've got a tree and you, you get a little bit of rain to get your grass to grow. 
when it gets hot, when the weather turns and turns really hot, the last place the grass actually starts to wilt is underneath your trees. Yep. And your cattle like the shade too. Like, yep. I know I don't like standing out in the hot sun, I'd much rather stand under a tree when it's yep. really hot. So your cattle are more content, which again probably boils back to a holistic approach to managing animals and managing your 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 vegetation. Yep. And just clearing country and leaving all your tall trees, like all your lovely little birds like your little shrubs, your little spiny yes. shrubs, your little yes. where they can get in a nest and hide where they're away from predators yep. and you get rid of all them and you've got no little birds. Yep. You've only got your big birds which yeah. Well, I did all my primary here. I, I would have started here when I was five and would have left at the end of 52, so it would be seven, eight years. Yeah. And I started in 41 when the school opened, and I'm the first one on the roll. Oh, right. <laughs> the first student on the roll. Yes. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I finished in grade seven, so. Mm. Mm. And, and by 1941, did you still have kids riding in? or You're walking or you rode a horse or, or a push bike? Mm. Quite a few mm. rode horses. Mm. No such thing yes. as a school bus. And the horses would have been tied up down here on the ground. Oh, oh, they were just let loose here for a period of time. Inside the fence? Inside yes. the fence. And one family at Mount Binger rode five miles. Yeah, yeah. And that's right. And they used not come around the road so much. They'd cut through the shortest way through, well, through my father's property for one and another property up here. They you, you never went around the road unless you really, there was some specific reason. You'd open someone's gate and go through. And yeah. the, the thing was in those days, you never asked for permission. Everyone did it. Everyone knew yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. We'd all stand out here in line. If you look hard enough there, you might even find that there was a line there, a line there where the kids stood and marched. So you had your little lines worn there. Yeah. And if you look hard enough there, they might we still be there. The flag, what else we yeah, that's right, the flag was <laughs> over there, that's right. And you sung the national anthem, which was uh, God Save the Queen, of course. Every day. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. yeah. God Save the, the King, it would have been in those days. Yeah, march yeah. into school. March into yeah. school. You march in. But the, the history of the district, and um, MacDougall is all over uh, that history. Yes. Kuya Station was owned by Ronald MacDougall, and it was put up for selection in about uh, 1898 and uh, that's when Elizabeth and Keith McDougall got the uh, block down here, it's called Corralgen Homestead and the district was named after them. Then. And it's Corral Gin, not Corral Gin. No, Gin. I've been told that very clearly, it's Gin. <laughs> Is that an Aboriginal name or where does that come from? No, no, it came from... His grandmother named it after a story she was reading in the paper from Brisbane. About another homestead called Corralgen. Corralgen in mean, the Never Never or something. Corralgen in the Never Never, which is a piece of fiction. And it's a very nice tale. So she thought, that's a good name for a, yes. for a homestead. I'll name my property that's Corralgen. Right. Yeah, well, why not? Yes. And then when the mill came there, they said, can we name the district Corralgen? Uh, my father and his brother come to the district in 1929. 
uh, and the story has been told that uh, their father, who, uh, who was Eddie Keem, uh, he had property at McLagan, a uh, fairly good country, but very short of water. And my father tells the story that uh, his father and the brother, the three of them, come to Corrales and to look at the property up here that Clary McDougall owned. It was one of the selection blocks. One of the selection blocks, it was 1,300 acres. And Dad always tells the story, and we all smile at it that. Uh, Grandfather took one look at that running water from the creek after coming from McClague and he said, we're not looking any further, this will do. <laughs> so I don't know if that's right or not, but my father used to tell that story. And that was Kuya Creek? Kuya Creek. He thought it was, he just thought it was something else to see this running water because whilst they had good country over there where they were, they had struggled to find water. But all these properties up here, they cleared the scrub and had scrub fires. So what's a scrub fire? Though? It's when you fall the scrub first up and then you've got all the Just fallen a... scrub that's lying there and then they will burn that off to get rid of it so as they can then when it's right, up goes grow whatever in it, put it down with grass. I think a lot of them corn. have put a, grow a crop of corn or two in it and then put it down with grass and establish their dairy farms. So this seems to me, because they're all sort of flat plains, mm -hmm. you see it looks like dairy country to me but it's there's not much dairy around. It. There's none in here now. No. They, every one of these, they were all dairy farms, every one of these everybody, places, everybody, were, everybody had a dairy in those days. Mm. Mm. The big change that I've noticed recently, in say the last 10, 20 years, is that uh, all of these flats back then were cultivated in one way or another, growing loose and or forage, sorghum, or oats, or even grain crops, and so on. It's nearly all grass down now, but that's that's a trend that hasn't only happened here. It's it's happened even over around Kringaroy where they used to madly grow peanuts and because of some of the dry years and so on and failed crops um, a lot of them have gone out of peanuts over there and they're simply just you know grassed it all up and running cattle. I can remember when all the major floods were like in my time there were several in the mid 50s 55 56 uh, there was not another big one where the creek broke its banks till 74 and there was no, there were three in the 80s, 81 when Dolby went under, and in July 83, you don't usually get a flood in the middle of winter, but it did break the banks in July 83, and then 88 when Kuya Township got washed away, and then there was 11, 2011 and 13. I don't know which one was the biggest, but that often varies because what will be the biggest flood in the creek, in the upper creek, uh, won't be the biggest flood down creek and vice versa depending on how the rain falls and, and so on but they, they were the major floods in my time well 74 i think was probably the biggest flood it and that's could have been I lived down there and, mm. and just a, i've got photos of it from the corner of the house to where the water was and you can see the house down there there was a big lagoon across there that um, must have dried up in about the 70s mm. Mm. my kids were had a boat out there on that lagoon and uh, what were they doing? About the 70s, there was still water in that lagoon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Behind me are the remnants of the Filchi and Broadfoot sawmill, which opened up here in Keralgian in the 1910s. We've come across in, on our walk and in the research records of probably 10 or more sawmills between the Dagila Highway today and the Bunya Mountains. So all along Kuyar Creek, you had sawmills. Uh, as the land was uh, settled and opened up, obviously it generated a lot of timber. On the south side of the creek, you had mainly eucalyptus woodlands and forests and on the north side up on the ranges here behind me are uh, mainly vine forest which produced a lot of pine hoop pine and banya pine and so forth but as the timber ran out uh, eventually they started closing down these mills and this is one of the remnants that we've come across Left. On the north. And that is
This is the Ted Pukellus Weir. Uh, it's a gravity dam built across Kuyo Creek and supplies the Yaraman region uh, with drinking water. It was built in 1967 and extensively damaged in 2011 during the floods. You can see on the uh, very top of the, of the dam structure that the lip has been replaced, so quite large repairs. And it all sits on private land. This is all private land. Uh, you can't access this at all. The only way to do it is to join the Yaraman Fishing Club. And they have an, uh, an access arrangement and they, they obviously contribute to, to the maintenance of this place. And they also stock the weir with uh, some fish, including Mary River Cod. So an absolutely beautiful piece of uh, water. It sort of snakes its way a few kilometers upstream from here. And a beautiful piece of nature, which you otherwise would have just driven past on the highway. So this is end of walk. My two co-walkers, uh, Luke and Ron, they've uh, moved on. They're going home, they're in their cars. And I'm just here wrapping up. And it's been a lovely day, uh, 18 k's worth of walking. Next walk is going to kick off on the other side of the highway, Dagila Highway behind me. And we're going to follow Kuya Creek northeast, probably for about 30, 40 kilometers before it meets the Brisbane River Junction. So we need to get access to that land. We need to have uh, landowner approvals, ideally have opportunity to talk to the landowners while we're walking. We'd love to do that. And there's a bit of research to be done. So a lot to be done for the next episode, but I hope to see you there. Thank you.